Hi, my name is Melissa Obradka. I'm a dental hygienist, a complete and total dental nerd, and a podcaster, and I am super excited to share this practice inspiration with you today on how to put an end to the struggle with oral systemic centric care. I've been a hygienist for more than two decades, and I got to tell you, I started to get a little bit bored and exhausted with dental hygiene, and I can't wait to share this change with you. So before we dig in, I just want to let you know that I am employed part-time with EMS as the U.S. GBT Education Manager. The opinions that I'm going to express in this presentation, however, are solely my own from my own clinical experience and not necessarily of any of the companies or products I may mention in this practice inspiration. These opinions are my own and not by these organizations. And also what I discuss is for educational purposes and doesn't replace your personal independent judgment. So let's dig in with the oral microbiome. This is really what's kind of changed my personal perspective on how I approach day-to-day -day patient care. What's really interesting is if we look at our patients and we look at the oral microbiome, what we can find out with our scientific advances is that one millimeter of human saliva is gonna contain about 100 million bacterial cells. And these bacteria originate from highly special, specialized and distinctive communities of organisms that reside in a variety of different environmental niches in the human mouth. So we can't really say those things to patients, right? And what we're trying to do today is really establish a new language so that we can take these uber science things that we know as dental professionals and understand and bring them and present them and articulate them in a way to our patients that they have a better understanding as to what's going on in their mouths. Because they think that, you know, they have bacteria, they need to brush and floss and rinse and come see us twice a year and everything's good. But that's really not the case. We know and understand that there's much more to it. So what we wanna be able to share with our patients is how big this oral, this microbiome is and how impactful it is, not just in their mouths, but in their total body health. What we know now with science and all of the discoveries is that we have more microbial cells in our bodies than we do our own DNA cells. We've got about 10 million microbial genes as opposed to our 22,000 DNA genes. And this, mi this microbiome is composed of bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. And it's really being known in the scientific community as the second genome. And it's because of these advances in science that we're able to even distinguish these different biofilm communities and identify different bacteria. There's so many that we don't even know exist yet, but it's these changes in science, and we all know RNA and um, PCR testing from COVID that's improved our analysis of the bacterial diversity in our, the oral cavity. And we're identifying more and more species every day. So we have to figure out ways to communicate that with our patients, right? Keep them engaged and understand the impact of this in their bodies. So a lot of times we can make these connections with our patients and identify what they already know and help bring them on this learning journey along with us. And why this is so important is because science keeps on growing in this evidence base of how impactful periodontal pathogens are to not only our oral health, which we all know and understand, but our overall systemic health. So what this study shows us is that high-risk pathogens will adversely influence the atherosclerosis pathogenesis triad. So what that means is that when patients have uh, pathogenic oral bacteria and its entry point into the bloodstream through their bleeding gums, now we have a higher risk for a contributing cause of a t or arterial disease. And the dental community has a substantial opportunity to mitigate the number one cause of morbidity or mortality, namely cardiovascular disease. So this is where we have such a huge opportunity to rewrite this narrative for our patients right in our very own operatories. The bacteria that's residing within these biofilms are responsible for the inflammatory cascade and subsequently the destruction of the supporting tissues of the periodontium. So that's where this entry point happens for our patients. And when we help them understand this through language that they know. So 
everyone really has a great understanding and awareness of gut health. And the term leaky gut is pretty well established within even the layman communities. They understand what that means. That means that there's bad bacteria that's causing a break in the seal of their gut lining. So when we bring what they already know into the dental operatory and make these connections for them, it can really open our patient's eyes and mind to understanding that there's a bigger risk involved than just having bright teeth and no cavities. So when I say things, when I identify this inflammatory response for my patients, I tell them that they have leaky gums when I identify bleeding on probing. And I explain to them that that means there's evidence of disease and this is not normal. And we need to take specific steps to put this disease in, into remission and then keep it in remission with specific maintenance routines at home and in the office. So some of the science and evidence has shown us um, these different things that are connected to pathogenic oral bacteria. And we have to really take a deep dive with our patients on their medical history intake and looking at these associated familial risk factors so that we can do the proper education that's precise to each individualized patient. So they can understand their genetic predisposition and risk factors and how the condition of their mouth could be affecting that or increasing the risk to turn on these genetic predispositions. So when it comes to cardiovascular disease, the process occurs from the bacteria in our mouths entering the bloodstream through their leaky gums and then having the ability to stick into the fatty acid plaques in the bloodstream and that's going to contribute to blockages and these pathogens can trigger this inflammatory response swell reduce that blood flow and increase that risk for a cardiovascular event we know that a lot of our patients have Alzheimer's dementia, and by 2050, it's projected that people 65 and older are going to have Alzheimer's dementia is going to reach 12.7 million. So that means there's going to be a lot of our patients in our chairs are we're going to watch this decline happen for them. But what we can be compelled to take action and do things differently with is the fact that we have so much research to show that P. gingivalis is in the brains of our Alzheimer's patients, creating what's called gingy pains. And those gingy pains can be present in our patients for years before they present with signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's dementia. So when we simply ask our patients if they have a family history of Alzheimer's dementia, we can then assess for that risk factor, take salivary samples, identify if they have PG in their oral cavity, and then create a precise treatment plan based on reducing this risk factor for them. There is documented relationships between depression and chronic periodontitis. These studies date back from the 1960s, associating periodontal disease severity to increased anxiety, and also in increasing the levels of certain hormones like cortisol in these patients. So this has a negative effect on the periodontal immune mechanism. And when we have patients that are depressed, it's really hard to get them to commit to what? home care. They barely want to take care of themselves. They're having a hard time making it through the day. So brushing and flossing is not high on that priority list. So when we see someone who is actually in our practice presenting for care and we know that they have a history of this, we can really educate them as to how impactful their oral health plays a role in their severity of this uh, disease. When it comes down to periodontal disease and diabetes, we're so much well-documented uh, information about the bi-directional relationship between these two disease states, making each other uh, worse. However, when we take a look at this study, this evaluates the impact of long-term treatment of periodontal disease on glycemic control with type two uh, diabetic patients. And what this shows us is there was a positive change in the HbA1c HBA levels following initial periodontal treatment and supportive periodontal therapy. So when we look at how impactful that is for these patients, I am a firm believer that any patient that is uh, diabetic should be on a three month recare just so that we can help manage this disease because we know how closely they are intertwined. So I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think that our patients know that they have these links between their dental health conditions and their overall health conditions? And what this study shows us is that globally, 21% of people on average thought there was a link between their overall life expectancy and dental health. 
that's a pretty small percentage. And we have so much opportunity to be able to educate our patients of these connections and why they need to come into our practice more frequently, why it is such a huge priority for their oral health from a professional standpoint, and why they really need to commit to behavior modifications for self-care regimens at home that are going to help reduce the amount of risk they have from pathogenic uh, oral bacteria. And that's where I really love to encourage dental hygienists to step it up into their role as the gatekeeper of overall health. When we take a look at how the oral biofilm has affected our patients and breaking down that gingival barrier that we easily see on our assessments by bleeding on probing. Again, remember those leaky gums. When we identify leaky gums, think of it as the gate. The gate was locked when we have a healthy patient. There's no way for that bacteria to get into the bloodstream. But once we identify bleeding on probing, the gate is now open and these pathogenic biofilms can get into the bloodstream and have the systemic impact of all the different examples that I had just shared with you. Now, mind you, there are many, many more examples and I would encourage you to go out and do some more research on your own of the oral systemic health conditions and links. But this is where dental hygienists, we really we can start to change the perception of our roles within not only the dental practice, but within the healthcare community. We really are uh, the, the providers that see our patients more really than anyone else in medicine, and we're doing it from a preventive aspect. So I will encourage you to rethink your approach to periodontal disease. Periodontal disease is a medical disease with a dental therapy. It's a disease and also an infection at the same time. So if we take a look at how we traditionally treat that with our power scalers, our hand instruments and profi angles and profi paste, we're not really equipped to really meet the needs of this disease to put it into remission and keep it into remission. And that's where guided biofilm therapy comes in. So uh, guided biofilm therapy is a way for us to really treat patients in a systematic approach while meeting the individualized needs of each patient. This protocol can be applied for a healthy patient and a gingivitis patient or a patient who has active periodontal disease, periodontal maintenance, and also implant maintenance and with orthodontic cases. So we start with our assessments and our data collection. We are looking to pull in that data, looking at that medical history, making those uh, connections with familial history as well, asking those questions about, you know, do you, do you or any uh, people in your immediate family suffer from specific diseases so that you can really gather that data to make those connections. Completing our radiographs, checking our bone levels, taking a look at our full comprehensive periodontal screenings, disclosing our patients, making those assessments really help us curate the care to our each specific patient's needs. We can also start to add in extra adjunctive therapies for our patients. I just got this salivary sample report back yesterday in my office, and this is such a key component in my patient's treatment. We are going to alter our treatment out, uh, treatment prescription based on these results. And then we also can have an interdisciplinary approach with our medical care providers. This patient specifically had open heart surgery in 2021, and we have pathogens off the charts that can contribute to cardiovascular risk. So knowing this and bringing this information to our, his cardiologist is gonna be a really key piece of this patient's care plan. So disclosing biofilm is something that I started doing within this workflow, and it's been such a game changer. I didn't want to do it when I first started. I just thought it was an extra step that was unnecessary. But once I started actually committing to the process of disclosing patients, it was by far the biggest, most positive shift that I had in at that time in my practice. And what it does is really put the ownership of disease on the rightful person, which is the patient, not the practitioner. It gives the patient, we can now explain the etiology of their disease process based on the color of the biofilm. So I love to use uh, GC America's triplac gel, which helps show us new plaque, which is less than 48 hours old, older biofilm, which is more high risk, which is gonna show up as blue or purple. And then also we have a, uh, acid producing biofilm that's going to show up as light blue. And I 
will bring up my patients prior charting right up on the screen after we've disclosed and we're looking together at the areas of the disclosed biofilm and making the correlation with the pocket depths and the leaky gums. And then we move into motivating our patients through specific oral hygiene instructions that are going to meet the needs of their patients, of that specific patient. And we do that while the biofilm is visible. And this is such a key component because normally in the day-to-day -day of a harried practice, we will kind of throw a goodie bag at a patient on the way out of the operatory and say, hey, don't forget to brush and floss. I threw some mouthwash in there for you and toothpaste. I'll see you next time. But that's not really going to help our patients understand what they need to do, how they need to do it, or the, the frequency or have any other different adjuncts that may be helpful for them to achieve this behavior modification we're looking to achieve. And this study shows us that professional mechanical plaque removal without home care instruction has really little benefit for our patients. So um, one of the other things I share with my patients in the operatory, especially when we're moving into initial periodontal therapy, is that 80% of the result we're going to get in success is based on what they do at home. 20% is me mechanically removing the bacteria for you here. So if we don't get that behavior commitment from the patient with committing to oral hygiene and, and committing to it on a routine basis, then I'm telling them right off the gate, we're not going to be successful. We may have to repeat this treatment again in the future. So um, I've also seen that it's been such a benefit for patients when we do oral hygiene instruction while biofilm is visible, like we're taught to do in dental hygiene school, um, because now, again, they can actually see as I angle the toothbrush properly and show them the proper movement. I encourage them to bring their electric brush to their appointments with them so I can instruct them on their own with their own tool that they use. And they can see that biofilm removing while we're doing it that way. They can see it as we move through interdental brushing or flossing or whatever interdental needs fit their, their oral condition. And it's been a really effective way. I get so much more patient buy-in this way. And it's been a, a really nice side effect for me as the clinician is as they manage this uh, their biofilm at home better, I have less work to do when they come back for their maintenance appointments. So it's a win-win for everyone. Putting that time in up front within the appointment is fantastic. And then patients look forward to this in their subsequent appointments as well. They like it when we disclose them because it's a way for them to check. They're like super excited about not having any dark blue purple biofilm when they come back because they've been working super hard at home. And I would encourage you to look at innovations uh, in self-care, especially when we have patients with implants. These are some of my advanced cases where the Basic brush floss rinse does not fit the needs of these patients. So I do really encourage you doing some research on the different types of home care products. I like to have a lot of tools in my toolbox so that we can meet the needs of the different patients. Um, implant patients especially, we know that they need a different kind of regime, a different kind of arsenal of products to really meet the different types of implants, the prosthetics, the bars. Um, the emergence profiles, there's so many factors regarding that. So we want to be able to have a lot of different things to offer these patients so they can have long-term health and success with their implants as well. So now we're going to get into how we actually treat our patients. And you notice that the first three steps of our protocol is data gathering, uh, doing our disclosing and motivating our, motivating our patients with oral hygiene instruction. The next three steps are debridement, where we're going to do airflow, perio flow if our patient qualifies for that to decontaminate bacteria into five millimeter pockets, and then piezon to remove remaining calculus. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So this is our traditional method of care. We pick up our ultrasonic first, and we go ahead and remove both calculus and biofilm. Then we grab our hand instruments and we scale away. 
Then lastly, we do a third pass around the mouth with our Profi Angles and Profi Paste. Now this approach is showing you how we are disclosing our patient, we're making biofilm visible, we're reviewing our motivation and oral hygiene instruction, and now we're going to pick up our Airflow Max and we're going to remove both biofilm and stains simultaneously on the hard and soft tissue, which allows for a total mouth decontamination. And as you see this biofilm removing, we can see the different layers. We can see that there's acid producing biofilm underneath that more mature biofilm. So that really helps us make sure that our patients are educated of those associated risks. There's so much information in disclosing. Once we've removed all of the biofilm and stain, we're gonna pick up our piezon PS to remove any remaining calculus. We don't have to instrument every surface of every tooth if there's no calculus present. So that makes us more efficient. So let's disclose the whole mouth since we did a split mouth comparison to see. We're not removing all the biofilm with our conventional approach to care. And that is where we are missing the mark for our patients. So we want to be able to really be comprehensive in our care for our patients and meet the needs, this biofilm disruption need that we know is so greatly tagged to our patient's overall health as well as our oral health. So that's a quick insight into uh, my practice inspiration with guided biofilm therapy. I wanna thank you so much for inviting me to share my love for integrating systemic health into our, our practices. I hope I've inspired uh, other hygienists to work as a healthcare hygienist. And thank you for having me. Thanks so much.